Hey everybody, welcome to today's uh, Kubernetes Masterclass. Really glad to have you all on the line. Uh, as, as normal, we have quite a few people who are registered to attend this class. Um, before we get started, I want you all to know that this session is being recorded. Uh, so you will receive, uh, after the training, you'll receive the, uh, the recording and the slides in your email. So for whatever reason you need to drop uh, or you miss something, you, you wanna go back, uh, don't worry, you will be able to revisit this. We will post it on YouTube and we will email it to you, uh, the recording and the slides. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, authentication and authorization for multiple uh, clusters with Rancher. Um, and just to get started as a way of introduction, my name is Matthew Shear. I am a marketing manager here at Rancher. I help host these sessions and our intro uh, training sessions on Thursdays on uh, Rancher and Kubernetes. We also have a K3S intro session tomorrow that I'll be hosting. So yeah, I'm kind of like your point person for resources. If you are looking uh, for a recording or a slide or some other you know, educational resource or something that you need to understand about Rancher, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can email me or reach me on the Rancher user Slack. I expect a lot of people here uh, are already on that Slack. Um, that free Slack resource for our community, but uh, we'll mention it a little bit later as we go on. And uh, the person who's really going to be doing the heavy lifting on um, today's session is uh, Rajashree. Uh, Rajashree, are you are you here? Uh, hey, Matthew. Yeah. Hey. All right. Wonderful. Uh, well, I'll let Rajashree uh, introduce herself a little bit more as we go along, but please don't hesitate uh, to connect with either of us. We really want to be uh, helpful and useful uh, to everyone on the line and everyone who wants to learn more about uh, managing Kubernetes with Rancher. Um, looks like my slide presentation just closed. Let me open that back up so you guys see the right slide. All right. We have you know, about 40, 45 minutes of presentation to go through, so there's quite a bit to do, uh, but we try to be as responsive to what you all, all want to learn as possible. Please don't hesitate to ask questions. Questions are absolutely welcome. GoToWebinar has a really cool questions feature. You just you know, type it into the chat um, and we'll be able to respond. If you, for whatever reason, want your question to be private, uh, just let us know. Otherwise, we'll answer it for the benefit of everyone. And we'll kind of take pauses uh, during the presentation and demo uh, to answer some pertinent questions and then have time at the end uh, to go over more questions as well. This session, like I said, is being recorded. You can find uh, this one and others on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Rancher. Uh, we put everything there. So all of our meetups, all our intro classes, our, our advanced training sessions, there's just a ton of resources there. So please check it out if you uh, want to learn more about any particular topic. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have a wonderful community that's very involved answering and asking questions and trying new things, uh, managing Kubernetes with Rancher. So check out slack.rancher.io. You can join uh, this masterclass channel for updates. And sometimes we post uh, manifests and other files that you might need uh, to do the demo or kind of follow up on the session so you can join that channel. But there are just a ton of channels on many, many different topics. Uh, so feel free to, to use that resource as much as you'd like. And just a quick plug for other sessions that we having, have coming up in this session in this uh, series. Next week, uh, we'll be going over uh, a data, data management strategy with one of our Rancher partners. Uh, so that should be really good. And again, these all these sessions are free. Uh, sign up for as many as you want. Um, ask as many questions as, as you'd like. Um, and then after that, uh, in September, we'll be going over automating uh, cluster life cycles, backup, and disaster recovery, um, and then finally speeding up applications with K3S, you know, Rancher's lightweight uh, open source Kubernetes distribution uh, and, and traffic. So uh, with all that out of the way, we can get into the meat of the material. So Registry, I'm going to pass the presentation over to you, make you the presenter, sure. uh, and then we can get going. So just made you the presenter. Okay, come on. Uh, okay, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. I can see your screen and uh, you're good to go. I can see also this, the uh, slides 
uh, preview on the left. So if you want to keep that, you can. But all right, yeah. I okay, I just uh, how do I minimize this? Hey, Matthew. Yeah. Oh, okay. Actually, on my webinar control, it showed it started showing as paused. So I thought that maybe the presentation is paused or something. Anyway, okay. I'll just carry on. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, so good morning, everyone. And once again, welcome to this master class. And in today's session, I'll be going over the various authentication strategies that Kubernetes supports. Along with that, the different authentication providers that Rancher lets you uh, integrate with so that you could use uh, users and groups from your existing um, access control systems and have them log into Rancher and manage, uh, like have access to the clusters. And also finally, the uh, main RBAC framework that we have implemented, which is mainly built on top of Kubernetes RBAC concepts. Uh, yeah, but we'll just take a look at how it helps managing access control across different clusters and so on. Uh, so I started working at Rancho Labs in around 2016. And at that time, along with Kubernetes, we used to support multiple other uh, orchestration platforms, uh, orchestration systems. Hey, Roger, I just, I want to interrupt you because I think your, uh, your slides may be frozen because uh, we still oh. only see your first slide. Um, oh, okay. uh, so yeah. yeah, just stop sharing and then reshare and we should be able yeah, to. Yeah, I'll do that. Cool. Okay. Um, it still says paused when I showing paused. I'm not sure. Okay, I'll stop sharing it again. And oh, main screen. There Can we go. And now we see, yeah, we see Kubernetes everywhere. Slide. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, so as I was saying uh, earlier, like back in 2016, we were still working on Rancher 1.6 version. And we used to support multiple orchestrators along with uh, Kubernetes. And that time also we realized that Kubernetes was extremely popular, but then we saw that over the next few years it gained like it uh, like became tremendously popular, and a lot of big companies moved towards Kubernetes and like uh, wrote articles about why they chose that. It became very clear like it comes as no surprise considering the robust design uh, that is put behind Kubernetes, and like it helps us manage and deploy our applications and it's extremely like it's scalable as well since all these companies move towards uh, kubernetes that goes to show that it's considered to be really secure and we are going to take a look at some of the concepts in kubernetes that make it this way that make it uh, secure like there are a lot of aspects involved but we are going to focus mainly on the authentication and rbac concepts so uh, as like as kubernetes um, like gained a lot of traction major cloud companies such as um, like amazon and all started providing hosted case offerings such as eks aks and so on so if you were just starting to use kubernetes a couple of years back maybe it like initially bringing up a cluster could also have been like would also have been difficult because there were like there are a lot of components involved in bringing up a functional case cluster there's uh, control plane components, there's etcd nodes and worker node components, and just having them all running properly, making sure that the communication networking between them is established properly. That that like that yeah, that can take a lot of time. But uh, because the Kubernetes adoption has increased so much, there are various tools and products such as Minikube, RKE, K3S, KubeADM which help you in bringing up a, a cluster up and running like very quickly over here i have mentioned single node clusters because let's say if you're just trying uh, starting with kubernetes and you just want to uh, like, like see how it functions then it's extremely easy to now set up a single node cluster but of course you can use uh, these tools to have uh, like bigger clusters as well and yeah these are really nice solutions to uh, like reduce the learning curve that is associated with setting up clusters but as and how you start using cluster in your like team or organization, like when it's not just limited to you, you would want to give the other users in your organization access to these clusters as well. And at some point, you will also realize that multiple clusters would become a requirement. And these clusters could come from a variety of different um, 
like case pro like case providers such as gke aks eks or you could deploy your own cluster on like on prem or another like on other um, like cloud instances and so on so the reason i say that using multiple clusters or like in general using multiple clusters has kind of become necessary like there are multiple reasons behind that one of them being uh, the having phys the need for physically separated clusters so let's say you have an application that is supposed to handle traffic from um, from multiple regions so um, what you would do is you would set up a cluster in each region and then manage all these clusters properly and you can also set up a global load balancer so that the traffic is routed correctly now i know that a kubernetes cluster can include a big number of nodes uh, but it is generally recommended to have these nodes like instead of having the nodes in a cluster spread across different regions it's recommended to have um, a cluster dedicated to each region and you can keep these clusters small you don't need to have multiple nodes but it's just helpful in terms of the communication that takes place between hcd and control plane components and so on another reason uh, for having multiple clusters is ensuring like logical separation first of all in terms of security so you might be aware of the concept of uh, let's say pod security policies so with that like let's say in a cluster you have added like you have granted a few users access to a cluster and you want them to be able to create um, like certain deployments certain resources applications but you can further control uh, the permissions that they have by adding pod security policies so they basically um, like decide like you can decide what kind of uh, pods they can create like certain restrictions that maybe users cannot uh, create containers with like true privileges and so on. So all of that you can ensure using port security policies. So maybe you have a use case in which one cluster, like the users in one cluster need to have a certain policy. Uh, or let's say you want to ensure that an application or a project that is running needs to only consume a limited set of resources. So you could apply a certain like quota to it. So in these cases, it makes sense to have a separate cluster dedicated to just that. And you could have uh, like less restricted policies for other users in other clusters. Another reason uh, why you would want logical separation among your clusters is just like functionality wise. Maybe a cluster is dedicated per team or maybe it's just depending on the environment that you're using it for. Let's say you have a cluster for your dev setup, one for CI and, and so on. Yeah, so now like no matter which uh, way you have chosen to bring up your Kubernetes cluster, and no matter how many clusters you're using, you need to set up ways to authenticate into your cluster for your users. So Kubernetes provides a lot of authentication strategies. I've listed some of them here. Uh, those include X509 client, like the client certificate based auth, or uh, the methods in utilizing bearer tokens, authenticating proxy, or plugins, webhook token authentication, and there are many more. So if we just take a look at a few of them, then this is how the client cert authentication works. Like you have to pass uh, this client CA file to an API, like to your API server, and it needs to contain valid uh, certificate authorities so that the client certificate, when it tries to authenticate to the server, uh, like yeah, basically the authentication succeeds. And in your client certificate, yeah, if your uh, like whatever subject you have provided, it becomes it is it becomes the username in the authentication request. Then another method is the bearer token based auth. So you can put the bearer token in HTTP requests in the following format that like I've written here. And uh, like, of course, you can find all of this information of the uh, Kubernetes documentation as well. But I've just picked up the parts that I want to include in this demo. And uh, yeah, so there are uh, like a lot of methods such as uh, Kubernetes also supports o like OIDC authentication. And in that, once you authenticate with your um, like OAuth provider, you basically get an access token, request token, and an ID token. 
and from that you use that id token field as the bearer token in the above request apart from that you can use service account tokens and like generate the get the bearer tokens to use in a request and the other methods such as bootstrap, bootstrap tokens or static token files also use this method so um like i won't go into much detail about which like comparing the different auth strategies but in general a lot of like all these strategies have their own set of pros and cons depending on your usage or maybe some of them have a really uh, like long duration and so if you want them to uh, expire earlier or if you want to rotate the credentials then you have to uh, manage it yourself but uh, taking these pros and cons into consideration uh, various like the different hosted case providers support different strategies for example gk uh, will support oidc authentication static password uh, to, uh, and client search and for the oidc tokens it like it utilizes the g cloud uh, accounts like you will have to use your g cloud account then for eks it uses a webhook token authentication using the iam authenticator so yeah basically the, some of these uh, case providers like have disable some of the auth plugins so you'll have to take care of that based on the cluster that you're using um and another thing is like let's say if you're using uh like gk or eks like it's it's really great how the like the way they handle authentication but along with having your g cloud or uh, like iam accounts you could also uh, like the company could be using a separate authentication system such as ldap or something so you have to make sure that your user has an account like there as well so um, as you can see like depending on the uh, cloud you're using for your cluster or if let's say you are using a hybrid cloud setup you have multiple clusters from different cloud providers you need to make like you need to choose an authentication strategy and it would be ideal to just have a single point of authentication because that way uh, once a user is authenticated into your system you don't have to worry about um, whether the user like you can then grant that user access to certain clusters but then you don't have to worry about authentication of that user another thing is once uh, like how do you manage our bag like uh, you maybe you want to grant a user kind, the kind of like same kind of permission across a few clusters or across a few namespaces in one cluster and um, also clusters are used for like i mean there are use cases where you would have multi, multi tenant clusters you could have teams working together in a single cluster and you want to ensure proper isolation of resources among them so that's another thing where our bag is required um and in general enforcement of uh, concepts such as uh, like auth security policies across like for a particular cluster and so on um, yeah so all these things can be a little challenging i mean like initially we discussed that bringing up kubernetes clusters is easy now but like managing them and managing the access that your different users have to them is uh, like is still not very easy and you just need to have a good system in place and at rancher as you all know we uh, like our goal is to manage all types of um, clusters that you may add to your rancher setup and uh, like it's kind of a provider like a kubernetes provider agnostic system so no matter which clusters you are using we want to ensure that you have a single point of authentication for the for like for all of your users and uh, yeah we like we have managed to put up a centralized authentication system so that the global admin of rancher can set up auth using any of the auth provider providers and that needs to be done only once and yeah so like also when you are integrating rancher with your auth provider uh you could have different users or groups or like teams that you want to have access to rancher so we have also implemented um like our back using uh, some of like by creating some of our crds to manage that as well so uh basically like as you can see because these clusters have different authentication strategies and some of the clusters have uh, like uh, like some of the gates providers have uh, blocked out uh, like the usage of certain plugins based on what they thought was best so what we have is like our rancher's authentication proxy sits in front of all of the kubernetes clusters 
and whatever request is coming uh, to Rancher, the auth proxy intercepts it. It validates, like it authentic, it makes sure that the user is authenticated, and uh, then it forwards the request to the appropriate clusters. So uh, first, we'll take a look at the various authentication. Now, like after we have discussed the type of authentication strategy that we use, we'll take a look at the authentication providers that we support. So we support a variety of providers, such as um, some LDAP-based providers, such as Active Directory, uh, Free IPA, Open LDAP, and then we also uh, support a bunch of SAML providers like Pink Federate, Keycloak, ADFS, uh, and so on. And starting 2.3 onwards, we are also adding a Google OAuth provider. And I'll talk about these providers uh, like in the next few minutes. So another thing that we uh, like another concept, another Kubernetes concept basically that helps all of this is user impersonation. And it's nothing but the ability to uh, act as another user, like impersonate another user. And it is achieved through headers called impersonate user and impersonate group. And again, this is all uh, purely a Kubernetes concept. So how we put, like, put all of this together, uh, let's take a look at the implementation details. So Kubernetes manages service accounts as like the core resource and like, like Kubernetes will basically consider two kinds of users, either service account users or normal users. And we have the service account resource as a core resource, but we don't have a particular uh, resource for to represent a user. So um, we realized that we needed to use like a dedicated resource for users. And that's why we created a user CRD. And we have a couple of other CRDs along with user that stores entire information of a user. Now this information uh, includes, let's say you authenticated your user, uh, like have set up an authentication provider and your user authenticates into it and logs into Rancher. So during the login, we uh, request your authentication provider to send us the entire user uh, profile like the profile for that user and it includes things such as display name field or like login name and one important field it includes is the uh, principal id sorry like the unique id based on the authentication provider you're using so let's say you are using active directory on open L or open LDAP. Uh, the uh, like the unique id that we could use is say distinguished name or your sam account name or uh, upn so any of these fields that are used as the unique ID on your provider side get mapped to a principal ID section of our user CRD. And if you can see in the screen, I have mentioned a point for principal ID. So let's say if you have authenticated with Active Directory, it will create a principal of the form Active Directory underscore user, and then it will uh, append the distinguished name of that user to it. And uh, also we try to fetch all of the users groups when the user is authenticating and we store that information as well, like the groups principal IDs as well. We need to request the information of groups because that's how we enable group based membership access into Rancher. So let's say if you have a team of users who you want to access Rancher and you don't want to individually add those users one by one to Rancher, then you could just add that team that they all belong to. Uh, but again, this works uh, really well for most of the auth providers, but um, for some of the auth providers, such as the SAML based providers, there's a limitation that you basically SAML pr a protocol itself only supports like is for authentication and it does not support lookup. So there's no way for us to make a query to your SAML provider to say fetch another user or fetch another group. But during logging in, we still uh, get a list of groups that this user belongs to. So once you have logged in, uh, after authenticating to your SAML provider, we still have a list of just your groups and you can add those to any of the clusters within Rancher that you want. And uh, yeah, so once the user is authenticated, once we have obtained the principal ID, we use that principal ID as the impersonate user header and the groups of that user are used as the impersonate groups header and the authentication strategy that we use so that you can connect to your clusters is the bearer token based auth 
so in that the request or like the header that we had seen earlier the authorization bearer header is used and that token is passed to make the request yeah so i'm just going to uh, okay before going forward okay so oh, how do i minimize this So as you can see, um, like this is a cluster that I've set up. And um, if I go to this page, I can see all of these uh, different provider options that are available. And in these, you have to provide uh, the details specific to the authentication provider that you or your, your company is using, basically. If you just want to get started, you can just like use GitHub Auth. That also works well and the new provider that we have added in 2.3 it, it, it's not available yet i think in any of the releases i'm, I'm not sure but uh, like it will be a part of 2.3 so for this especially there are a lot of steps involved because of the way uh, google handles oauth and oidc and um, like you have to provide a few of these fields which are marked as required like you have to provide all the fields that are marked as required so basically it includes the oauth credentials and uh, we have given a link on how you can generate your own set of credentials. So um, all of these instructions are listed here. Then you also have to uh, provide us with some service account credentials. And what the service account does is it's just requesting read access uh, for the list of users or groups in your uh, Google hosted, do hosted domain setup. Uh, this is to enable the group based membership again. And like no matter like, Whenever we are requesting any access, we are only strictly uh, requesting uh, like read access so that we don't like transfer doesn't get uh, access permissions or more permissions than required to your auth provider setup. And um, yeah, so actually, I just wanted to uh, show one of my setups where auth uh, like authentication was set up but something happened to my uh, previous set, uh, like previous branches server that i was using so uh, what i wanted to discuss is i'm just going to look up in the doc so that i i have a reference okay yeah so this is what i wanted to talk about right now i can't see any of the site access control options because no auth is set up and unfortunately the previous rancher server i was using i i think i shut it accidentally uh, but anyway so the site access options will show up once you set up an auth provider and these are the options if you choose the first option any valid users from your uh, organization will be able to access this rancher server like as long as they know the rancher server url of course and so obviously this setting is not recommended because it's like you you don't want uh, this is particularly for github but uh, like in general if you're using active directory or anything you don't necessarily want all of the users to be able to log into rancher then the second uh, site access option is allowing like yeah allowing members of clusters projects plus authorized users and organizations so basically if you have added a group or a user to a cluster or a project that like users belonging to that group will be able to log into rancher and access that particular cluster or project and uh, on the site access control page itself there shows up another list in which you can add certain users and groups and that uh, includes the author like that constitutes the authorized users and organizations list and the third access mode is restricting access to only that list of users that you have configured on the main authentication page. So once again, if you come to uh, the global view, security authentication, once you're done setting up any form of auth, uh, like a window will show up at the bottom, which will contain these three options. And you can choose according to your needs, which option works best for you. But generally the second and third one are the, uh, oh, sorry. The second and third one are the most recommended ones. So, another thing that I kind of wanted to show. Sorry. So, um, this is my global view right now. 
and in that i can list all the clusters that i have created so far i can of course go to this cluster using the rancher ui and rancher ui makes a bunch of api calls and makes all the resources that you have so far available so in this cluster you can see the different nodes and all that are present there uh, now let's say you want to connect to this cluster and like you just want to use the cube config file which is generated for this cluster for some scripting purposes and you don't want like you want to have minimum ui interaction for some scripting reasons so you can do that by generating this cube config file uh, it contains uh, information such as the token that is generated for this user and um, like you can use this cube config file and you can directly use the token that is generated within this cube config file as well uh, you can pass this token to a kubectl command uh, like using a token flag or you can again put it in that authorization bearer header request that we uh, sorry where authorization bearer header that we saw earlier also you can just directly interact with your uh, kubectl sorry directly interact with your cluster uh, by launching this shell here again for this as well a token is generated now these uh, tokens for that are generated for launching the kubectl shell or kubeconfig file uh, they are uh, like yeah so like basically you can just directly use them to communicate with these clusters uh, they don't give you access to like any other cluster in rancher but they are specifically for these clusters and associated to only your user account within rancher So yeah, so now I'll go over the implementation details in terms of the uh, CRDs, the custom resource definitions that we added. So first of all is the token. That's what I was just now uh, talking about. Uh, you, like, you can get a list of all the tokens that are created so far in your setup using kubectl get tokens. And we generate tokens for a user when the user logs into UI or let's say if the user generates API keys. Uh, for that also we generate a token and just now we saw that you can connect to your cluster through the ui shell so for that the token that we generate is of this form kubectl hyphen shell hyphen the user id and we also generate a token for connecting to the cluster with kubeconfig that i said earlier so it's of the form kubeconfig user id dot cluster id and if you see that any of your tokens need to be deleted then you can um, Oh, sorry. Then you can navigate to v3 slash tokens and you can select any one of them and delete them. Or uh, v3 tokens will mostly show the tokens that are generated for you. But in general, if you want to delete any other tokens that are associated to some other user, then you can always uh, list out all the tokens and then you can uh, grab them using the user ID like you can uh, use the user id of whose tokens you want to delete and then grab the tokens using that then comes the user crd that i had mentioned earlier uh, so yeah these like this contains the fields that i had said like for display name and login name and this field that if you can see the principal ids uh, it will contain that principal id which is formed by using the uh, your unique ID from your authentication provider. And yeah, this second CRD is the user attribute CRD. Uh, so in that we store the information of the groups that your user belongs to. So uh, your user could belong to multiple groups and maybe once the, like once the user logs in, we pull uh, this list of groups and we store it in this user attribute crd and it's not made available in the like to view in the api but of course you can use a uh, kubectl to view it so another thing is let's say you added a user into rancher and then um you, like that user behind the scenes in your authentic like in your auth provider system got added to a few other groups or got removed from a few other groups uh, so you want that user's membership list to reflect in your rancher setup as well and that's why uh, we periodically keep refreshing a user's information by fetching that user's latest information in the auth provider. And uh, so again, this setting also can be configured. So if you go to here, 
auth provider. Yeah, so over here, if you can see auth user info resync, so we can uh, like resync the auth provider group memberships uh, periodically using th this time period, and it's configurable again only for the global admin. Or you could go to the users list and just click on refresh group memberships if you feel like this action needs to be taken uh, right away. And I'm just gonna delete this. Yeah. So yeah. So like as you can see. If you go to the users section in the global level, you will see a list of all the users. And if you want, you can view them in the API as um, like that's the same case with all other uh, resources in Rancher. Yeah, so you can view them in the API and you can see the uh, principal ID that is generated. So by default, Rancher enables local authentication. And of course, it is recommended to use an external uh, authentication system. But since I'm uh, like, you know, sharing my screen, it, like I, I preferred using just the local auth for uh, this demo. And sorry. yeah, so now let's uh, take a look at the RBAC framework. And like I said earlier, Rancher's RBAC framework or the RBAC logic is built entirely on top of the Kubernetes RBAC constructs such as role, role binding, cluster role, and cluster role binding. I'm sure most of you are already aware of all these concepts, but um, I'm just going to quickly go over them. So a Kubernetes role basically allows you to uh, define a set of rules. Now, each rule specifies the actions that are allowed on namespaced resources. So, like, let's say pods and deployments are namespace scoped resource types. So, in this example over here, we are creating a role um, in the namespace team A, and it contains the following rules. So, like, anyone who has this role can get list or watch pods in the namespace team A, and anyone who has this role can also uh, get list watch. Uh, only a certain deployments in the same space. So like for the pods, the rule is very uh, broad for that one namespace, like all uh, pods in the namespace can be viewed. But for deployments, let's say you just want to restrict further, you can use another field called resource names and just specify the names of those uh, resources, just the names of those deployments that you want users to have access to. And then there's role binding, which is again a namespace scoped resource. And a role binding uh, re references a role, and it binds this role to a subject. Now, subject is basically a user or a group or a service account. So, like what this example means is, user A can list all pods in namespace team A because of the role and role binding that are in place, and it a user A can list only two deployments uh, in namespace team A because we use the resource names uh, concept as well, like field as well. Now, cluster role is basically a role which is scoped to a cluster. So you can define rules on cluster scoped resources and namespace resources as well. So as you can see, I have added a rule for the resource nodes, which is not scoped to a namespace. And I've also added a, a rule for the resource pods, which is scoped to a namespace. And um, like since this uh, cluster role is like you can uh, like the role binding can also reference a cluster role and what it will do is it will just apply that role for whatever subjects are present in that binding to that bindings uh, namespace but of course you will uh, in most of the cases you will end up using cluster role with a cluster role binding now a cluster role binding as the name suggests it binds the cluster role to a few subjects and subjects again here also is either a user or a group or a service account so rancher definitely leverages all of these concepts but since rancher has another level on top of all these clusters to manage all of the user clusters we need a proper access control at that level as well and for that we have added two crds which are global role and global role binding so I think as the name suggests, they follow the role, role binding and the cluster, cluster role binding concepts. So let's take a look at uh, those as well. 
these are the two crds and in that if you can see for the global role uh, the third field is rules and that is using the kubernetes policy rule um, definition uh, so again, the rules can be defined in the exact same way. You can uh, include the resource types, you can include resource names, and finally the verbs that indicate the actions that can be taken on those resources. And then a global role binding is uh, the second CID, which binds this global role to a particular user. So if I go to, again, to the global level security, and then if I go to roles, uh, I can see that all these roles that are listed in the global context are basically global roles. So over here, you have an admin role. Uh, if you go, your admin has permission over everything in Rancho. And mostly, like I've seen uh, users choose either the user base or the user global role. So let's see what the user global role has. It has... Uh, and, and yeah, like our UI does a great job of listing out all the permissions, like all the rules that are associated to any role. So in the user global role, um, anyone who gets this user global role will have uh, the following permissions on these resources. And let's say if you want a more restricted uh, set of rules for your users, then you can uh, select the user based role. As you can see, there's this field called new user default. And right now the new user default is set to user. So if I uh, enable some external authentication provider, like let's say Active Directory, and I add some of those, uh, some of my Active Directory users to my Rancher server, when they log in for the first time, they will assume this user global role. And if you don't want that to be the case, you can uh, go to uh, like the user based role and yeah, and you can edit and you make you can make that as the default role for new users. Apart from this, you can also go to the users page and you can like when you are adding a user, you can uh, decide what global permissions that user wants, which again will associate that user to uh, the corresponding global role. So the standard user role corresponds to the user global role that we just saw. And the, the second global role that we saw, the user base, that corresponds to the custom login access uh, permission. And of course, we have admin. Along with, like, apart from that, uh, like, we saw all of these roles in that roles page just now, like a role to create cluster template, create clusters, and so on. Yeah, so that's just what we discussed right now. Like we saw that the global roles are kind of um, like predefined roles which have different levels of permissions on a lot of resources. Now, another concept that I wanted to discuss that Rancher has introduced is that of a project. Now, a project is a CID that we added for further like fine-grained access control. It is a collection of namespaces. We saw earlier that roles are applied to a particular namespace. And let's say you want a situation in which uh, a team is working on multiple namespaces. So instead of having to create a role binding per namespace, uh, you can, like, we provide you the option of grouping those namespaces into a project and then applying that role to that project. So project at the end is still a namespace, but it just, uh, it can propagate down those roles on whatever conditions you have added to a project to all of the underlying namespaces. Another thing is you can also use project for uh, multi-tenant clusters, like it's really useful for that as well. So like, let's say you have created a, a project A dedicated to team A and project B dedicated to team B. So like all the users in the project can collaborate very well, but then uh, user, uh, the cross project co collaboration isn't possible because uh, users who have access to project A, like the project A is basically, like all projects are completely isolated from one another. So users who have access to project A won't be able to access project B and that way like multi-tenancy can be ensured. So let's see how that works. Now, again, this is the global plane as a global level. And in that you can go to any of the clusters that you select. This is the cluster level and you can go to uh, projects namespaces. These are some of the projects that are already available. Um, so we create two projects per cluster by default. The first one is the default project. 
and as you can tell it corresponds to the default namespace that is created in a in every kubernetes cluster and another namespace that exists in all clusters is the cube system or the kubernetes specific namespaces so we create a project called system which groups these namespaces and generally we don't like we advise not to uh, change anything in this particular project because your cluster depends on that so you can click on add project here um, of course provide a unique name and this pod security policy can also be applied at a project level okay i actually forgot to mention the pod security policy creation so like if you go to a global view again and if you go to security uh we covered authentication we covered roles and you can also go to bot security policies and i think these are the ones that we provide by default but you can add your own policies as well and let's say you want to have a different sort of policies even within a cluster uh you can do that by utilizing the concept of project you can select any of the psps that you want here then while creating a project you can also add any members that you want um like type in the search box and uh, it like ui will make api calls to the uh, configured auth provider to look up that user or that group in case of most auth providers and uh, yeah we have uh, resource quotas as well that you can um, apply to a particular project so in kubernetes you might be familiar with the resource quotas that can be added to a namespace by adding it to a project to ensure that all namespaces i believe collectively follow that quota and yeah this way you can uh, create a project oh actually i'm um, uh, like i'm sorry i was initially going to pause for questions in between but i completely forgot to do that uh matthew are there any okay. questions yeah no worry there's a there are a couple questions right now um okay. the first is from uh rajesh who asks can Rancher provide the central authentication for imported clusters? Yeah, the central authentication also exists for any type of cluster. So basically any cluster that you create, um, yeah, any cluster that you create from here, over here you have an option of importing a cluster as well. So I believe, yeah, we can, like, we, uh, yeah, like all of that falls under Rancher's centralized authentication. Okay, great, awesome. Um, and then the next, the only other question that's been asked so far is from Marcy, who asks, are these uh, user CRDs available now, or does this start with uh, version 2.3.x? You know, uh, oh, it has been available for a while. Uh, like, it's available. Okay, terrific. Um, yeah. Oh, a couple more questions that just come in. Uh, is it possible to limit, this is from Jed, who asks, is it possible to limit resource utilization by user or only by project? Yeah, I think I just, uh, like, we just now covered that maybe that question was asked earlier so like you can use the resource quotas feature uh, to limit the resource utilization at a project level and um, like you have that available at a namespace level also so if you don't want to like if you just want to limit it for a user maybe it makes uh, sense creating a namespace and then applying the resource quota there but you can also have it at the project level okay great Cool, that's the, only, that's the last question, so, so keep going. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, uh, done with that. And now, like a couple of more CRDs that are, like we still have to cover for our back. Um, so, another CRD that we have, have added is a role, like is the role template. And it basically defines a template for role creation, and this can be used across uh, like all clusters and across all namespaces in all the clusters so i'm just going to quickly show that if you again go to the global view security rules uh if you go to the cluster or project scope rules what you will see here are the role templates you can click on any one of them view an api and it will show you the role template cluster member uh it will also like you can also through the ui go to any of them and see the list of permissions that it currently has these are some of the built-in role templates so like we recommend like you like basically you can't you shouldn't be changing them but if you want to create your own custom uh role templates scope to a cluster you can click on this add cluster role and so you can either select and choose resources that you want this 
particular role uh, to have access to or you can just inherit from one of the existing roles another thing you can do is you can just clone this existing role and that we create your own role having the exact same permissions and uh, also we have the same concept of role templates which are scope to a project as well now they just vary in the resources that they are granting permissions to like most of these resources are scoped to a cluster whereas these are scoped to a namespace or in this case a project and again you can follow the same logic of uh, of adding the project role i don't know why it's saying a cluster role here maybe some glitch but yeah you can add a project role over here as well um so now let's let's see what happens when you add any of these users like i've created a bunch of users here so let's see what happens when you add any of the users to a cluster using the role templates that are already present so i'll go to the members list and i can just type in that uh, user i want to use, add this user as a cluster member so if i Yeah, so basically it makes a post request to this cluster role template binding API. And if I view it in API, I will see the V3 cluster role template bindings uh, section. So this cluster role template binding is again a CRD that we added and it binds a particular user to a cluster with one of the role templates. So in this case, the role template that I used was cluster member, which we saw on the roles page. And this is the user ID, user principal ID, and so on. And since I've added, uh, since I've added user like this user as a cluster member, this user will be able to uh, log in and log out and like access the cluster as a member. Will have a, a limited set of permissions. And uh, let's say you don't want to uh, like like you want to have minimum minimal ui interaction for some reason and you can't add users or groups through the ui then you always have the option of scripting it you can use our api to do so um so i'm just going to go to my uh, users page let's say i want to add this user Right now, there are only these two users, and I'm just going to do um, okay. Oh God. <laughs> Let's see if that added to you. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what happened with my command that I was using. Okay, I'm just going to let that be. I don't know why, uh, but as you can see, you can go to the V3 API and click on create and you can select the cluster ID that you want. User principal ID will link to only the existing principles. Uh, so let's say you just selected admin for a while and you can select any of these role templates, click on show request. And over here, uh, you can copy paste the curl command. And of course, like, be sure to uh, provide the appropriate user principal ID. Since I'm using local authentication, it will be local colon uh, the user ID. But if you're using AD or GitHub, it will be uh, like GitHub underscore user or Active Directory underscore user. And in AD and GitHub, you can also add groups. 
So for that, you will go back to uh, the edit screen, select any group principal ID that exists currently, and you can add that as well. And uh, yeah, so uh, the similar CID exists at the project scope as well, which will let you add any of the users with a project scoped role template, and it's called project role template binding. And another thing that we just uh, that I wanted to discuss was I already covered it was the port security policies. So you can apply the same port security policy across multiple clusters by creating one globally and then passing it down uh, to the cluster. So for the cluster creation, if you go here and uh, let's see. Yeah, so over here you can select whatever port security policy you want. And um, and yeah, so finally, the last thing, actually, I think I forgot to cover this earlier, but um, the auth config, like we also have another CID called the auth config. And the three access modes that I had discussed earlier, like whether you want to allow all valid users from your organization to log into Rancher or only those users that have been added to a cluster on project. So all of that can be controlled by this field called allowed principal IDs in the auth config as well. So let's say for some reason, if you're not going to use the UI, you can create, like you have to make sure that you create proper uh, valid principles using the, uh, the unique IDs of your users, and then you can apply them to the auth config as well. And uh, yeah, so uh, that that's it. yeah, that's about it actually. That's all that I wanted to discuss for authentication and RBAC. So Matthew, are there any uh, more questions? Oh yeah, there's a couple more. Um, thank you so much, Rajasri, for putting this all together and for taking us through the demo and all these great great educational yeah. slides. Mm -hmm. um, uh, awesome stuff. Okay, so here so the, here's the first question. Um, this is also from Rajesh who asks, are there any parts of the centralized authentication that cannot be automated? Uh, so, yeah, well, when you, if you're click, hang on, sorry, how do I go back? Okay, uh, so if you're selecting any of the auth providers such as AD or Open LDAP, it's pretty straightforward to automate those because all the details that are required to set up auth can be prevented through an API call. But in case of providers, let's say such as some uh, SAML based providers or GitHub, which require user redirection, like we actually uh, take you to your um, identity providers URL. So that those providers, like the setup of those providers itself can, cannot be automated. I mean, um, I, I think using uh, tools like Selenium and all, it's um, maybe uh, doable, but I haven't tried it out. So that part can't be automated. But apart from that, if you want to add users to a cluster or project, uh, like we just saw, you that can be very well automated. Yeah. I hope that answers that. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, if you have, uh, Rajesh, if you have more questions, please ask. Um, okay, here's the next one. Um, I see, uh, this user says, I see that Keycloak SAML is supported. Why isn't Keycloak IODC supported as well? Oh, the, yeah. So, yeah, Keycloak client, you can either configure SAML or like OIDC auth, but I think we just started out with SAML because I think that was one of the requested providers from what we saw in the GitHub issue. Uh, but if you, like, if, I believe there is another issue open for Keycloak OIDC as well. Uh, so maybe we'll get to it in some of the releases. But the thing is, we can't um, like even if we are adding Keycloak provider, uh, we have to add it pro like uh, separately for each protocol because the internal implementation ch changes based on what protocol you're using. Like how we will fetch for your user information on how we'll fetch for your groups that depends on the protocol that we are using. So that's why it's not added yet. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, that was the last question, uh, Registry. So is there anything else you want to leave us with? Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll take the presentation back. Yeah, no, that, that's it. Okay, awesome. Um, oh, you know what? One more question just came in. So if you don't mind, I'll just ask you this. Um, this is from Jed, who says, um, let's see, he says, I don't see the global account templates. Um, are they in version 2.1.7? So I'm assuming he has that version. 
a rancher? Uh, global account templates. Maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but um, I mean, if the account you're referring to is the user, then I'm not sure what global account templates uh, means. Yeah, he so, says global user, global admin. Okay, so he is not able to um, see the users created or under security roles he can't see. So if if you go to security and roles and if you cannot see any of the roles here, then uh, it's because you are not the admin of Rancher. Like you could probably be added to a cluster and that's why you, uh, to a cluster or a project and that's why you have access to Rancher, but only the global admins can see this set of roles. Okay, cool. And Jed, you know, if you need more help on that, maybe you could join, uh, get on Slack um, and ask. Um, also, the training on Thursday uh, does go over, uh, you know, authentication in brief, and you can ask your question there uh, to our engineer as well if you, you have more context you want to add. Um, yeah. And if okay. the answer about the global roles didn't clear it up, then yeah, please feel free to ask it on Slack. So. Great. Um, anything else, Rajasri? No, no, that's that's it. Okay, cool. All right. Well, let me let me um, close us out with the final uh, few slides to recap uh, some of these items. So, let me take the presentation. For those who might have missed this in the beginning. And see if you can see, see my slides. Um, so for those who just missed this, you know, Rancher is totally free, open source. Um, there's no hidden features. Um, so you will get started. Um, everything is in Rancher as soon as you download it. So if you want to, uh, and you're not yet uh, started with Rancher, just go to rancher.com, click the deploy button. It'll bring you to these quick start guides and you can uh, get started with Rancher in just a couple minutes. Uh, as I mentioned before, we do have intro trainings on Rancher and on Kubernetes. If you're also new to Kubernetes, um, that are that are just fantastic. So those are on Thursdays. Are also free, and we you know we stay as long as we need to. Sometimes two hours just to answer uh, questions. Um, so please check that out. You know, Rancher has a ton of other projects going. And Rancher is our sort of flagship uh, central Kubernetes management uh, platform, and there are just a ton of other innovation going on right now. Um, you might have uh, heard K3S, uh, lightweight Kubernetes distribution. We have a training on that uh, tomorrow, actually. Um, and just a lot of other projects. So uh, if you are interested in those, uh, please check them out uh, on rancher.com or look for one of our, our trainings to find out more. Um, and as we mentioned before, this series, these master classes on various different Kubernetes topics uh, is ongoing. So we have one pretty much every week coming up in September. Uh, again, these are all free to join and the recordings are posted on YouTube uh, so that you can check those out. Uh, but if you wanna attend live, that's where you can uh, ask your questions and, and see the demo and, and try it yourself. Uh, so next week we'll be talking about data management um, strategies and the following week on, on automation and then finally ending September talking about speeding up your applications. Uh, so please do check those out. Um, we just want to thank everyone so much for attending. There is a survey at the end, so if you can take a couple minutes to uh, fill that out, it helps us come up with new topics and see you know, what we can address better and present better for you all. Uh, and as I mentioned, this session is recorded, so you will see uh, the recording and the slides uh, in your inbox, hopefully end of day or uh, latest tomorrow. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks so much in Rajasri, great job. Thank you again. Thanks.